Good evening. Welcome to North Beat. I'm Megan Roberts. We begin tonight in Nunavut's Baffin region, where hurricane-like winds have led to damage and power outages. There were blizzard warnings across the region this week. Wind gusted up to 133 kilometers an hour, hitting the communities of Kikatarjuak, Pangnuktu, Igluluk, and Sunirayak. In Pangnuktu, a power line was knocked down in the storm, cutting electricity to the high school, government of Nunavut offices, stores, and homes in the hamlet. A scheduled flight carrying Kudlik Energy Corporation staff couldn't land in the community earlier today. Some residents posted photos on social media of items being blown straight off the ground. As of late Friday, QEC says it's waiting for an update on a charter. Ottawa is now taking the first step in creating a public alert system for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Olivia Stefanovic has more on the proposed red dress alert system. Such a long wait. Stephanie English says she wished there would have been a public wide nuts. alert when her 25 year old daughter Joey went missing. I really struggled with that. How I found out with my daughter, one of my daughters is uh, the knock on the door after 19 days later. Ottawa is now trying to change the way the country responds to missing Indigenous women, launching consultations to make a new emergency notification system a reality. Just like Amber Alerts for missing children, a red dress alert would notify the public on their phones whenever an Indigenous woman, girl or two-spirit person goes missing. All those opposed to the motion will please say nay. Carried. A motion by New Democrat MP Leah Gazan received the support of the House of Commons for a red dress alert. There's no more time to wait. There's no more time for excuses. We need a red dress now. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls recommended a nationwide emergency number for disappearances. The first 24 hours that a person goes missing is, is absolutely vital uh, to use to try to locate the individual. The inquiry's chief commissioner has since worked with Washington State to develop North America's first alert system for all missing Indigenous people. Because something this advocate grandson, says she wants Canada to follow. Our men and boys who are just as valued, of course, as everyone else. English says the time to act is now. It's been eight years and I still haven't heard anything about my daughter. And it's, it's very important, very crucial that we have that support from the government. It's a matter, she says, of saving lives. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. The government of the Northwest Territories announced a plan to crack down on illegal cabins almost three years ago. So how has that plan been going? Sarah Kamilowski has been digging into a couple of court cases that shed light on this, and she's here now to tell me all about it. So, Sarah, can you start by just reminding us about this plan? So, you know, squatting in the Northwest Territories obviously is not a new problem. There's cabins all over the place. You might know a squatter. But in February of 2021, the then Department of Lands announced that it would be persecuting all squatters in the territory and that all illegal cabins they wanted to have removed. Um, but the process that they developed to evict squatters has a lot of steps. And as these two court cases show, it can take a long time. Let's dig into those court cases. Tell me what's happening with them and just how long it can take. So one case that's before the courts right now is that of senior GNWT employee Frank Walsh. And Walsh admitted in court that he's had a cabin on Narcisse Lake, which is about 15 kilometers northeast of Prosperous Lake, since 2007 or 2008 around. He told me that he knows he's squatting and that he acknowledges that he has never tried to get a lease. I have no problem admitting I'm, I'm squatting. So in that sense, it, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm doing something illegal. Um, do I feel it's wrong? No, I don't feel it's wrong. 
So the first notice posted on his cabin was posted at the end of February in 2021, just weeks after the territory announced the crackdown. And that notice said that he had 30 days to show a lease or some other proof of legitimate claim or the territory could pursue legal action against him. But that's not what happened. When he called the Department of Lands, they said they told him they were just collecting contact information and that they would follow up. They did, but it was almost a year later. And it wasn't until more than a year after that that the case went to court. Overall, it took over two and a half years from the time that first notice was posted until his first court case. And we know that this case isn't the only one that's dragged on. Another squatter on the same lake got his first notice on the same day as Walsh, and his first court date hasn't even happened yet. It's next week, almost three years later. And it really seems like this kind of drawn out process is having an overall impact on the initiative's success. The Department of Environment and Climate Change told me that since the crackdown started, they've ordered that 43 cabins have been taken down, but only five cabins have actually been removed. Okay, so a lot of cabins being served notices, not a lot of cabins actually being taken down. Is there anything being done right now to improve this process or speed it up? We asked the Department of Climate Change to provide a comment on you know, why this is taking so long and whether they are doing anything to improve it. But we were told that no one from the department could comment because of the election blackout for media, which actually is still going on. I also spoke to DLO Chief Fred Sangreese about the problem because a lot of the unauthorized cabins are on the traditional territory of the Yellow Knives Dene. And he said this is a really important issue to members. Illegal cabins can and do interfere with harvesting rights. And he said he was really disappointed to hear that only five cabins were gone. He also hadn't heard that yet. He heard it from CBC. Nobody from the department had provided that update to him. And he said that he would like to see the territory consult more with YKDFN on this in the future. Okay, Sarah, thanks for all your digging on this. Thanks for having me. Safe at Home, a housing advocacy group, wants to hear from residents in Watson Lake. Yesterday, people gathered at an open house to share their concerns and ideas. Cheryl Kwaja has more from Watson Lake. Lack of housing is a huge issue here in Watson Lake, and many people turned up here yesterday to talk about the issue. The Safe at Home Society recently hired a staff member, a housing coordinator, to work here in the community. Inside, many people told me they'd come to check it out, see what was going on, and people had different ideas. One woman told me there really needs to be a men's shelter here. Another said the community doesn't have a soup kitchen. And also the idea that there needs to be some kind of place for people to gather, that connection is so crucial. Everyone I've spoken with here in Watson Lake says housing is critical at all levels. Today I had the chance to drive around town so with former like councillor Aaron Labonte. Both of these houses are condemned. This one has been sitting condemned for like 15 years. So they just put boards on it recently, so that's really nice. She really wants to see the territorial government build an apartment complex and to sell back many of the homes it now owns to people in the community. We stopped at the site of a new 10-plex supported housing complex that's going up. It's on the site of an old condemned apartment building where dozens of people used to squat. This is the only lot, like residential lot this size, and this is the only lot in town that is zoned to hold an apartment building. This project, in my opinion, is really short-sighted, being that it's going to be, for the foreseeable future, the only apartment building lot in this entire town, and it's only gonna have 10 units, and there's like 30 homeless people. Meanwhile, the Safe at Home coordinator told me that she hopes to get different levels of government and various organizations working together to help uh, solve the housing crisis that's happening. 300 questionnaires have gone out to mailboxes in the community. That together with what was heard at the open house will be compiled and there will be feedback with the community in the new year. Cheryl Kawaja, CBC News, Watson Lake. The Kaluit's nonprofits finally have a space to offer their programs and services. The Inusurvik Community Wellness Hub opened its doors yesterday. Dr. Gwen Healy Akiaruk is the executive and scientific director of the Kaluit Health Research Center, the organization behind the new hub. 
She says the building has been 15 years in the making. So all of us as not-for-profit organizations really struggle to find space and to deliver space for community health and well-being programs and spaces to support families to be well. We created the Community Wellness Hub as a place to gather uh, all of these different programs and services under one roof for families. The new services in the hub include a daycare, an elder counseling service, community spaces for training and education, and a community kitchen. The construction costs for the new hub came in at $12 million. And the new facility is already award-winning. It was recognized by Canadian Architect Magazine as a 2023 Award of Merit recipient. Lateral Office is the firm that designed the building. Mason White is one of its architects. He says this is the first building in Nunavut since 1973, which has received this recognition. The vision behind it was really to make a building that responded to the environment, the unique natures of the environment here in Nunavut, in Iqaluit, and one that had qualities of being open um, and one that had qualities of letting light in in a, in a site that's very difficult to get light in and views out. White says the inspiration for the building came from how the snow drifts up against it and how the light will hit the side of the building changing its color. He says this project was unique. His involvement on the project started from its concept 15 years ago rather than getting in at the design stage. After almost 20 years, a conference about the Arctic is being held in the Arctic for the first time. Arctic Net is an annual event. It brings together students and researchers from across the country. They discuss challenges and opportunities facing the Arctic, and this year, it's being held in Nikolaiwit. So I guess the mandate of, of Arctic Net is really uh, to understand the changing Arctic to develop policies to better cope with the changing Arctic, to better be able to predict it, and you know to work towards a healthy and vibrant Arctic uh, for everyone. The conference runs from December 4th to December 7th. It's at the Aksarnit Hotel in Iqaluit and in other venues around the city. The full agenda can be viewed online. For the first time, locally grown cannabis was sold in the Northwest Territories today. Boreal cultivation was started by a group of northerners. They say it's taken three years to get to today. The strain is called gas banana and it's only grown in Yellowknife. We went through a lot of plants and a lot of smoking to find that, that magic plant. And, uh, we, we love it and it's getting pretty good reception in the other provinces too, so it's, it's pretty cool to see. Right, uh, locally you can, you can bid at Relief and also Trailblazers locally. The Yellowknife-based cultivation facility has products on the shelves in the Yukon, Manitoba and Ontario. Boreal plans to expand with three more products currently being developed. I'm Kathleen Goltar, host of the new podcast, Crime Story. Every week we bring you a different crime, told by the storyteller who knows it best. All the ins and outs. It was a story of murder, of exploitation of a schoolgirl. You got one witness who can't be found. You got another witness who has changed his entire story. I remember just this feeling of like complete disbelief. Crime Story, available now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. You are constantly on the move, and so are we. Making sense of the moments that matter together. Looks like things are maybe winding down. Asking what, why, when. To the center of the biggest stories. Wow. Meeting the people living them. Thank you for letting us be here. What's your situation? Making sense of our world. How are we going to be part of the solution? With you and for you. Connectedness, groundedness. I'm Adrian Arsenault. This is The National. Yeah, dog! Oh. An absolute classic. All right! Let's go! Yeah! This is The National. Every week, the issues that matter to Canadians. These are acts of desperation. Connecting politics to people. Some people have lost everything. Join me for Rosemary Barton Live. Nestled 
in a bustling midtown Toronto neighborhood, there is a new bookstore specializing in Inuit and Northern authors. The CBC's Pauline Bimuk shows us the space. Inhabit Books Uqalimaq Taqfiq is a new Inuit-owned store located at 612 Mount Pleasant Road. The company held a grand opening with some special guests and local customers this week. People came by the dozens to check out the new store and all the excitement. Nancy Graham purchased a few books to take to her family overseas. She says she felt a connection with the Inuit stories. I'm going back to Scotland next week and um, two weeks. So I'm going to pick up some books for the boys mm -hmm. and I'll say the same thing, what they're interested in and I can take them back and say, you know, this is from Canada and from it's their equivalent of, you know, cans. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'll, get to, I'll tell them all about the books that I buy and yeah. where they're from. Books from authors who come from all over the Arctic regions are on display and available to purchase. But the company does more than just sell books. Inhabit Media shares their in-house resources. They developed free, downloadable educational resource packages for educators who want to use the books in their classrooms. Louise Flaherty is one of the co-founders of Inhabit Media and Taqut Productions located in Iqaluit. Our partners are also living down here and some of our Inuit staff live down here. So it's, uh, it's an option to, I mean, it's a very good option to have because Toronto is a gateway to the world, I find, where it's uh, easily accessible. Inhabit Media is the only independent publishing company located in the Canadian Arctic. The material they publish is to preserve and promote the stories, knowledge and local talent. Neil Christopher is the co-founder of the company. It's a rich culture of stories, it, and it's for the benefit of all of Canada. This is part of Canadian diverse cultural diversity. The North is such a part of our identity, it should be authentically told and, and respected. For those who want to find a unique Northern gift for that special person this coming Christmas, you can find authentic Inuit stories and legends at the new Oqalimaq Taqfiq Inhabit Bookstore. Pauline Pimmer, CBC News, Toronto. The 12th annual Arctic Sports Interschool Championships took place in Whitehorse this week. Yukon students from near and far showed off their skills and brought a new turnout record for the event. The CBC's Maria Tobin has more. Sixteen schools, 580 students grappled, kicked and jumped into the competition this week. The Canada Game Center field has flooded with the sound of cheering and squeaky shoots, along with the sight of smiles and handshakes. Our numbers were over 100 more than previous years for each day. So we have uh, grade 2 to 4 on Wednesday and 5 to 7 on Thursday and 8 to 12 Friday. While many students are participating for fun, a select few in the crowd are actually a part of the Arctic Winter Games training squad. High school student Augustine Greetham is one of them. He says the inter-school competitions keep him motivated with a subtle mix of friendly rivalry. It's just a good way to prepare because it's a competition, but we're still all friends. In typical competitions, athletes aim to beat a personal best or make the podium. But for students competing in this one, it's all about encouraging their friends. I just did one foot and I maxed out at 6'8", which is not my PB, but everyone has those days where they don't make it. But overall, I think it's going great and I've been able to talk to other people and learn from them and encourage my friends. Tryouts for the 2024 Arctic Winter Games have come and gone. However, officials say standout athletes from this week could be encouraged to go for future games. Maria Tobin, CBC News, Whitehorse. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, one school is working to keep kids connected to their Indigenous culture. It uses Indigenous knowledge and land-based teachings in its after-school program. The CBC's Jasmine Kaute went to check it out. Well, I mean, you should look behind you. A wampum belt is like something that like tells a story. What do you like about the law program? It's just all the like making stuff. Yeah. And like eating to feed us. We are here at Sherbrooke Elementary School. Tell me more about the WA program. 
So the WAP program is an after-school program that is all based on land-based teachings, cultural language teachings. Uh, we do everything from um, crafting, uh, cultural um, teachings, and uh, we do home-cooked meals for the children every day. It's been a really great experience being able to grow something so beautiful and so important for the children. Um, Your program focuses on, again, land-based and cultural teachings, specifically for, again, Indigenous youth. Why was it important to have that specifically for Indigenous youth? Um, because I feel like there's not enough going for the little ones, especially, you know, like a lot of the culture stuff, um, you know, our people are still learning a lot of the culture and stuff. And then because of our culture being stolen from us, basically, you know, like, um, I feel like it's just something that's so much needed so that we can be able to give a little bit of piece of the culture to the kids, you know. What's your name? Brave. Brave? Yeah. So tell me what you're doing. I'm making my moccasins. And yeah, this is the final day I probably will be working on this. I'm about to be done. What is your favorite thing you've made so far? I guess this. This one? Yeah, this it's one. Your current project? Yeah, my current project. <laughs> I love it. It looks great. Yeah. My name's Lily. Lily, what? Yeah. Uh, how old are you and what grade are you in? I'm 11 uh, and I'm in grade 6. So how long have you been coming to WAB, this after school program? Uh, I've been coming since the first day on September 18th, I think. Okay. And uh, how have you been finding it? I've been finding it really fun, good. And on Monday, we do like smudging. And we do this thing with a talking stick and then talk about our weekends. Yeah. Do you like that exercise? Yeah. Yeah. How can people help out if they if if they want to? Um. So I've had uh, a few people um, do fundraisers for us. Just basically, just really trying to get the word out mm -hmm. to as much organizations or if they know any funders or. Um, just places that are looking for programs like ours, you yeah. know, that are willing to be able to meet us, you know, and be able to support us. And it's a very beautiful program, you know, like to be able to do this kind of work with the kids and stuff like that. Like I really want people to see, you know, that the children are our future, you know, like and this is where it starts. And our thanks to the CBC's Jasmine Cabote for that piece. Two students from Alberta are making Christmas wishes come true all across the Northwest Territories. Hundreds of boxes of toys were delivered this week. Children in Tuktoyaktuk, Bechako, Yellowknife and Saks Harbor all got to open gifts. The donations all started with one RCMP officer a few years ago. Deslerine explains. They know I love gummy bears. They got me two packs of gummy bears. Nice. Christmas came early to this Tuktiakta classroom this year. Candy, toys, food, and clothing, all handpicked and packed by students and volunteers in Alberta, including Cole Garrity and Jarek McDonald. Garrity says seeing the happiness when the kids open their presents is worth the work. It's just great seeing their smiles on their face and. Um, how small things that in St. Albert for us would be like, oh, whatever. It goes a long way for them, you know? Thank you. Thank you. The toy drive started in 2020 when RCMP Reserve Constable Jeff McKay saw a need. McKay was stationed in Hall Beach and asked friends back home to donate gifts for kids. He says the response to his call out was shocking. So that night I had put on Facebook, it was, it was really, really unbelievable to get a, a package up here and it, it, it felt like I I was so excited it felt like I believed in Santa Claus when I was five years old that's uh, that's how excited I was Legos. presents were handed out in four NWT communities this week giving Santa a big run for his money Des Laureen, CBC News in Ube.
And that is North Beat for tonight. For news anytime, go to cbc.ca slash north. Thank you for watching. I'm Megan Roberts. We leave you tonight with this. Yellow Knifers woke up today to a city once again covered in frost. It was an absolutely beautiful sight. Have a great weekend and we'll see you again on Monday. Not a millennial. Yeah, well, Dr. Dre's not a doctor. I feel like such an imposter. You need money to survive. He had something to hide. Try typing with your thumbs. What do you call it? It's called a Blackberry. Huh. We call them Crackberries. There's a serial killer on the loose. Two attacks in a week. Go on. Everybody's got something to hide. We're not going to be here forever, right? Makes me want to make some changes. Your family can't take much more. I think you're a better driver when you're high. <laughs> think again. No alcohol, no drugs, no victims. A message from Mad Canada. I understand that you're struggling emotionally. Sure you wanna do this? I mean, it's research, right? You need to stop asking me for things I can't give you. You've done it my whole life. I was homeschooled as a child. You can only be as smart as your mom. That's it. Gross. Okay, cool. Woo! I love it. Get the news you need without restrictions. Download the free CBC News app.